These days, WWE has the -the state-of-the-art Performance Center, located in desirable Orlando, Florida, and fully equipped with absolutely everything to help prospective superstars as they train in the hope of making it to the big show. A genuine, honest-to-goodness wrestle factory pumping out camera-ready hopefuls who are given every tool and chance to succeed, the PC shows just how far WWE's so-called developmental system has come. Because once upon a time, the super stars of tomorrow were expected to grind away in a dilapidated warehouse in the middle of nowhere in Louisville, Kentucky. You might assume that such humble surroundings would not facilitate the growth of the athlete station there. However, OVW was responsible for grooming some of the men and women that would go on to become some of the biggest names in the business. They had a much vaunted golden era, sure, but Ohio Valley Wrestling existed before and still exists today, having survived while trying to keep up with an often unpredictable industry. My name is Tom Campbell from Cultaholic.com, and this is the history of OVW. Ohio Valley Wrestling was launched in 1993. It was an affiliate of the then dwindling National Wrestling Alliance. Founded by Danny Davis, well-respected journeyman whose wrestling career began in the late 70s and wrestled as the Nightmare. He was renowned as something as a tag team specialist was Davis, wrestling predominantly for the Continental Wrestling Association and then the Continental Championship Wrestling Promotion. And they ran shows in states like Tennessee, Kentucky, Alabama, and Mississippi. Davis would prove to be a pivotal figure in mentoring countless major league talents in years to come. However, in 1993, he was just trying to get his promotion established, running weekly shows out of Jefferson, Indiana, and even bigger shows from the Louisville Gardens. Some of the bigger names to appear on OVW shows back then included Tracy Smothers, Bill Dundee, and Rip Rogers, with some of the up-and-comers learning their trade at the time being the Basham Brothers, Nick Dinsmore, who would go on to become WWE's Eugene and Rob Conway, who would go on to have the greatest wrestling theme ever. Just look at me and I assign to see. You know it, you're humming it already. In 1997, however, Davis decided to secede from the NWA, which was a pretty arbitrary organization at this point, and go it alone, renaming the company Ohio Valley Wrestling. On January the 11th, 1998, they taped their very first episode of OVW TV, which would air in local markets via the WDRB Fox 41 network. The shows were, as you would expect, rather bare as far as production value went. But it didn't matter. The Davis Arena had a dedicated studio audience making all the noise they needed. There were lights. There were cameras. It was a TV show, which is not something that every minor league operation had to show off. The matches and storylines were basic and in the wild and woolly Monday Night Wars era, the promotion promotion didn't necessarily stand out or make a lot of noise, but it was a regular gig for the mix of rookies and veterans that called it home. And in an age where the territory system was gone and the independents weren't really flourishing, a reliable place to work was very welcomed. OVW would change dramatically in 1999, however, when an old friend of Danny Davis inquired about becoming a partner. This man would certainly make a racket if you catch my drift to get it because he he had a racket. It's it's Jim Cornette. Jim Cornette was working as a WWE manager and announcer, as well as being a member of the creative team, while Danny Davis was trying to put OVW on the map. As much as the Midnight Express man loved some of his duties and responsibilities, like working in the TV studio, getting to commentate alongside Jim Ross, he hated some of the other aspects of the job. He's spoken very openly about some of the aspects that he hated quite a lot on his podcast. And 
will continue to do so until the end of time. Like living in WWE's home base of Stamford, Connecticut, having to coexist with eternal enemies like Vince Russo and Kevin Dunn. Corny ran into Davis, who he'd managed in the early 80s back in Memphis, whilst visiting his Louisville, Kentucky home, and heard all about the work the Nightmare was doing with his promotion that, whilst getting by on a shoestring budget, seemed to have a lot of potential. Feeling burnt out and wanting a change of scenery, Cornette asked JR, then working as the head of WWE's talent relations department, if he could relocate back home and help Davis run OVW as an official WWE developmental territory. Now, WWE did already have relationships with several unofficial feeder systems, including one in Memphis. They also ran camps for future main roster prospects inside their training school, the Funkin' Dojo, ran by Dory Funk Jr. and Tom Pritchard. But Cornette was proposing an all-purpose modern-day territory that would train people and run a full schedule of shows, non-televised house shows, and TV tapings in order to get them ready for the main roster. Cornette, who had bought a stake in OVW, convinced Ross, and all of a sudden, Ohio Valley Wrestling had a contract with the largest wrestling promotion in the world. The first WWE-contracted developmental talent assigned to OVW would be Rico Constantino, one of many success stories to come out of a fruitful first few years of the OVW-WWE relationship. OVW was still its own independent business in many respects and generated their own revenue through tickets, merch, and sponsorship while this agreement with the WWF was in place. But now they had assistance, financial and otherwise, from Vince McMahon's empire and an obligation to provide them with talent. It was mutually beneficial from a talent perspective, you know, as WWE would also loan out some of its top stars, either as a way to draw for a big OVW show or because that particular wrestler needed to get ready for a return from an injury. Maybe they just wanted to kill time while the writers figured out something for them to do. So you'd have the likes of Mark Henry, Big Show and Ivory stop by for prolonged periods, while main eventers like Kane, The Undertaker, and even Stone Cold Steve Austin would make the occasional appearance on special events. However, OVW's bread and butter was the blue chippers that would become WrestleMania main eventers. The most famous class in this promotion's history included, get this, Shelton Benjamin, Randy Orton, Batista, John Cena, and Brock Lesnar. That's quite the lineup of studs, don't you think? All would be brought to WWE TV in the early 2000s and make an impact as key players in the days of ruthless aggression. With that crew, along with several other very talented individuals, the TV shows, as booked by Cornette, also starting to get a bit of a following beyond Kentucky as they routinely received rave reviews in newsletters and became a sought-after item amongst the tape trading community. Things were going great guns for a while as OVW continued to chug along, running wide-ranging shows that took place in front of dozens at flea markets to bigger events enjoyed live by thousands. Part of what made it work so well was that Cornette had such a good relationship with good old JR, someone he respected and considered a genuine friend. It also helped that the man in the black hat ran a tight ship and was courteous to Cornette, giving him ample notice if they wanted to bring an OVW talent to the main roster. However, a change in the talent relations hierarchy in WWE would have a knock-on effect for OVW as Ross was replaced by John Laurinaitis. OVW's track record between 2000 and 2004 spoke for itself as they continued to supply WWE with fresh talent who'd been scouted from various people including JR, Bruce Pritchard, and Gerald Briscoe. Orton, Lesnar, Cena, and Batista would have been a hell of a return regardless, but OVW graduates also called up for Raw and SmackDown at the time included Team Angle, the Basham Brothers, Rico, Victoria, La Resistance, Lance Cade, Nick Dinsmore, Tyson Tomko, Mordecai, and many others. And they would continue to produce results following the transition from JR to Johnny Ace, giving WWE the likes of Eminem, Ken Kennedy, Muhammad Hassan, Carlito, Chris Masters, Mickey James, and many more. 
anymore. But life wasn't as easy for Cornette and Davis, who didn't like dealing with Laurinaitis nearly as much as his predecessor, resulting in much frustration and frequent communication breakdowns. Laurinaitis wanted to implement more changes, like having OVW use standard WWE rings. He'd also put in requests for talent at very short notice, ruining OVW storylines and forcing TV rewrites. You can imagine how somebody as notoriously calm and level-headed as Jim Cornette took all of this meddling, can't you? The tension built and built and built with Cornette until he finally snapped in a spectacular, very public way. It all came to a head at a show in the summer of 2005 where Anthony Corelli, aka Santino Marella, failed to properly react to the boogeyman as he sat in the crowd. Rather than running from the supposedly scary superstar, Corelli, who was there with his young daughter, simply laughed in Boogeyman's face and stayed put. And this sent Cornette into a tailspin. When he got backstage, Corelli was both verbally chewed out and then slapped repeatedly across the face. This was not an isolated incident, by the way, as Cornette has a reputation for blowing a gasket at seemingly minor infractions. But this was the last straw. Cornette was placed on leave, and five weeks later, on July the 8th, 2005, he was released from his WWE contract, with the company relieving him of all of his OVW creative duties. All right, so Jim Cornette is out. Who should we bring in next? Maybe somebody less controversial, maybe somebody less polarizing. How about Paul Heyman? That'll do. So according to Bruce Pritchard, it was Stephanie McMahon's idea to send the former ECW head honcho to accentuate the positives and hide the negatives in Kentucky and give him free reign to run the place. While many saw this as a demotion for Heyman, who'd been working on main roster creative and recently as an on-screen manager of Heidenreich, Remember him? The man himself embraced the change, feeling burnt out after four plus years of WWE grind. He brought with him to OVW a change in philosophy, turning the promotion from a Southern style wrestling outlet into something more in line with Heyman's vision. This did not sit well with some, including many of Cornette's favorites or some of the OVW co-owners like Danny Davis. He was and a fan of sitting in the editing room for hours after TV tapings as Cornette had previously timed everything out to the very second. Heyman, not so much. The booking changed and a greater emphasis was put on in-ring product. Heyman had his own favorites like Brent Albright, Ken Kennedy, Mickey James, and was this CM Punk? Oh, I never heard of him. So naturally, they began to take center stage while some of Cornette's allies moved to the back or like longtime manager Kenny Bolin simply quit the promotion. While some talents certainly benefited from Heyman being there, the new OVW, OVW 2.0 if you will, wasn't exactly exactly a hit with the locals. Ratings and attendances dropped, and it became clear that this style of wrestling wasn't going to appeal to the bluegrass state. Heyman wouldn't be around for too long either, as he was brought back to WWE television for the ill-fated ECW reboot. From there, OVW began to lose its identity a little bit, as a revolving door of bookers and trainers came and went and tried to do their best with what they could under very often trying circumstances. Greg Garnier, Al Snow, Tommy Dreamer, and Mike Simon Dean Bucci all came and went from OVW. And it seemed to just enter a stage of existence, with WWE calling up fewer and fewer of their performers. In 2007, Cornette, then working for TNA, sold his stake to Danny Davis, as rumors circulated that WWE were about to sever ties. At the same time that OVW was operational, it's worth noting that WWE also had Deep South Wrestling, based in Georgia, as an alternative developmental territory. But that closed down in 2007, being replaced by Florida Championship Wrestling. We talked about Deep South Wrestling in another video. Go watch that when you're done with this one if you haven't done so already. That's a, that's a whole different mess over there. Eventually, in early 2008, WWE ended its association with OVW and sent everyone posted there to the sunshine state of Florida. Not only was OVW floundering, but relocated to Kentucky had been a bug 
bugbear for those in the system. So Florida seemed much more palatable. So that was that. After an eight-year association, OVW and WWE were no longer tied together. Though WWE would occasionally look at OVW talent and use them for extra work. And of course, they purchased the OVW tape library as well. WWE were from then on all in on FCW and before too long, NXT. However, OVW still remains in business to this day and has, in the years since becoming emancipated from the WWE, entered into partnerships with companies like Ring of Honor and TNA. OVW did struggle in the first few post-WWE years. They lost the WWE subsidizing money, their main local TV outlet, and a hefty contract with the Six Flags theme park, where they've been previously running some major shows. At one point, former WWE champion JBL even stepped in with funding to help keep them afloat. Since April of 2018, OVW has been run by Al Snow, someone who's had an association with the group since mid-2000s, where he worked as a commentator, a booker, and a trainer. Snow initially bought the company, but he sold his majority shares to an investment group back in January of this year. A lot has changed in OVW over the years, but they keep on going. They're not preparing guys and gals for the bright lights of WWE anymore, but they are giving wrestlers a platform to ply their trade as they work hard to get a foothold in the landscape. OVW's legacy will undoubtedly be the quartet of world champions and future Hall of Famers that they produced in the early 2000s. But as we've seen here today, its history is unique and complex and against all odds they've been in business in some form or fashion for close to 30 years we tip our hats to the chaps in kentucky and we wish another 30 my name is tom campbell from cultaholic.com stay safe and love you bye